Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. As Oklahoma's wheat crop continues to mature, this week we are talking about options for summer crops, especially as we enter what could be a dry growing season. Here's SUNUP's Curtis Hare and our Extension Cropping System Specialist, Josh Lofton. Oklahoma producers are getting out in the fields, getting ready to plant summer crops. So Josh, let's kind of walk through what producers are going to be planting this year. Well, I think it's going to be a little bit of everything, and, and, and I still think there's a lot of unknowns. Um, as far as commodity goes, uh, we're, we're still in a very unknown time. Um, nothing looks outstanding. Uh, there are a couple of crops uh, we're hearing that, that are kind of breaking through. Sorghum looks to be uh, kind of the, on the front of folks' minds. Uh, one, we know how to plant it, we know how to grow it. It's relatively cheap to, to get a decent crop. Um, we still need inputs, that, that whole mantra of low input crop, we, we have to get away from that. But it, it is one of those to where a seed cost and an upfront fertilizer cost, and to see what Mother Nature brings us this summer, it's, it's one that, that can be very promising. But um, pretty much a lot of our summer crops are in, op or, are in play right now because none of, them, none of them are kind of breaking from the pack and looking like the superior option this summer. Yeah, in, in times like this, it's always a good, um, when there's a lot of unknowns, it's always good to kind of think about for producers for cropping systems and when to let a field go fallow and, and, and things like that. Yeah, and it, it, it's important, especially when, when folks are planting and, and, and fighting uh, weeds in season, um, a good fallow season, uh, maybe you add in a grazing component or something like that. It's a good time to, to, to control your weeds, to reset rotations, to do uh, maybe a little bit of dirt work if we get uh, the, the conditions right. So fallow, fallow is part of a rotation. I, I know we don't like to see our, our ground lay empty for long periods of time, especially if we don't have any residue that that's a big problem in Oklahoma especially when the wind is blowing like it is we see a lot of erosion potential but if you have good residue out there and you have some things to take care of that might be a good option this year when there's not a whole lot of good options out there for the producers who are actually going to be out there in the fields planting you know this time last year we were dealing with some pretty historic flooding that went you know into June how has you know weather conditions been so far? Well, it really just depends on what mile marker you're at. Not even what county, but what mile marker within that county you're at is really going to tell the tale. We've heard some indication of growers are out there currently planting into really just pristine conditions, um, but we've we've also heard that as soon as you take that planter through the ground, you open that ground up a little bit and, and the, the heat, the wind, the humidity kind of just sucks a lot of that moisture out. We've we've seen a lot of fields go from near perfect planting conditions to too dry to, to finish germination in, in a very short amount of time. So um, we are dealing with that, but then of course we go back east and, and a lot of growers out there are, are dealing with, again, too much moisture you know in regards to uh, for people in those areas that might have you know a weather event happen or they're delaying are there any planting dates that they need to keep in mind where there is some wiggle room well, uh, for, for a lot of our summer crops, like our, our sorghums and our soybean, we, we like to see those planted before we get into about mid-May. Um, by the time we get into mid-May, what we're talking about is really, really poor conditions that typically occur in middle of July into the first part of August that coincide with some really critical reproductive stages of those crops. So if we get to that and you just don't have good conditions, maybe you've run out of moisture, you're waiting for rain and you just, you just don't get it, um, we, we see oftentimes, especially western side of the state, just delaying it to June is your best option. So I, I've heard a lot of growers that have grown beans in this state for a lot longer than I have say that that June 15th is, is almost ideal planting for most cases. And so we still have those options. The door doesn't close by mid-May. Um, it, it might shut for a while, but we, we get a good opening back again when we get into June because we do get more favorable conditions in August and September, November. Uh, when it, whenever that is going through those later growth stages. All right, thanks, Josh. Josh Lofton, Cropping Systems Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Summertime's always a busy time for any cattle ranch here in the Southern Plains. One of the chores that we've got to get done that sometimes I think slips through the cracks 
and that's to make sure that the minerals that we're putting out for the cows are getting consumed at the level that, that uh, we want them to be consumed at. And in some cases where there might be a medicated mineral, that it's very important that we get the right amount and therefore the right dosage of the medicated mineral into those cattle. If we're using a medicated mineral, of course, we have to work with our local uh, large animal veterinarian to make sure we have the proper veterinary feed directive in order to purchase uh, that medicated mineral. So you wanna visit your veterinarian about that possibility. As far as uh, other minerals, just for nutritional standpoints are concerned, making sure that the cattle get the kind of intake that you want is very, very important. Usually, uh, most minerals, we like to have them consumed at the rate of somewhere around two to three, maybe as high as four ounces per head per day. How do you know whether that's taking place? Well, you can do some monitoring of the mineral intake by keeping track of the amount of mineral put out, the number of cows in the pasture, the number of days it takes for them to consume that. And you can get a little help with that issue. You can go to the SUNUP website, that's sunup.okstate.edu, and there we'll have a link to an OSU mineral consumption record that you can download and keep track of that for each pasture. Also, at that same place, you can download a calculator that'll help you if you wanna just input that same information, the amount of minerals you put out, when you put it out, the number of cows in that pasture, it will actually do the calculations for you and keep a graph of the intake throughout the course of summer so that you can keep a good idea of what the mineral intake per head is in your situation. If you need to improve the intake, you might consider the location of the mineral blocks or the mineral feeders. Make sure that they're in areas where the cattle spend a lot of time, loafing areas such as shady areas, something around the water source where they travel next to a fence so they run into that mineral uh, feeder more often, that will help in terms of ensuring a little higher usage of the mineral feeder that uh, you've put out for them. I think if you'll uh, do just a little bit of extra effort this summer, making sure that you check those mineral feeders once a week, make sure they have dry, clean mineral in them, then we'll have a, a little more uniform, a little uh, more consistent amount of mineral intake getting into those cattle, the proper amount that you want. And we look forward to seeing you next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. We're out here at the Willard Sparks Research Center and David, they do a lot of research on cattle and, and efficiency. And this is a time that, that producers are gonna need some of that research that's done out here whenever they're making those livestock uh, decisions. It is. In fact, what you see behind me is a set of heifers on a feed efficiency research project. Mm -hmm. And that's what all this pneumatic sounds are going yeah. on behind me when they put their heads in and pull it out of that bunk. But, but yeah, it is. It's a time where people may be looking for options to extend ownership on their cattle because of the current market situation. One thing we thought about that some folks might be thinking about is retaining a few more heifers this year. Right. What, what are some of the things, what, what are some of the benefits, if there are any, to maintaining those and retaining those? I mean, a heifer uh, could give you more marketing flexibility, mm -hmm. you know, because you can, you can sell a, a yearling as a feeder calf. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and expose more heifers to uh, bulls through the breeding season, uh, and then perhaps have the flexibility to sell red heifers. You mm -hmm. could simply retain those red heifers and increase the size of your cow herd, uh, or you could possibly even hang on to them, calve them out as two-year-olds, uh, get, get quite a bit more time in the market, and merchandise them as cow-calf pairs. There's quite a few things to consider, but if, you know, if you're just gonna keep more females than you usually do, probably the things to start with are uh, keep females out of the really good cows. Right. Yeah, so, you know, one thing, for example, would be um, highly heritable traits that you really don't want, and that would be, you know, you probably wouldn't want to keep any of those heifers, in other words, go ahead and sell them early, right. out of cows that are wild. Right. 
uh, out of cows that have a bad udder. <laughs> Uh, that's a relatively highly heritable trait as well. I uh, wouldn't want to keep heifers out of cows that don't shed their hair coat early in the, in the spring or summer. Another couple of things that people might want to consider, uh, especially if you've got a set of heifers that you don't have much genetic information or you don't have much in the way of records on, like, like their birth dates, for example, yeah. uh, would be ha visit with your veterinarian about the possibility of reproductive tract scoring those heifers, that will give you an indication of whether or not they're going to be early in terms of puberty mm -hmm. and, and how good of an, a chance they would have of breeding early in that first breeding season. The second thing the veterinarian can do along with that reproductive tract score is measure their pelvic width and height and heifers with larger pelvic area are less likely to have dystocia problems or uh, calf, calf birth problems. Uh, the second thing uh, producers might want to consider is a genomic test. Uh, the companies that provide those for commercial cattle uh, will provide you with an index so that you can rank those heifers for uh, value or profitability uh, from highest to lowest. And then if they have the opportunity to maybe pull off the bottom end, it's be another good culling tool. So this really is an opportunity for producers to, to really get to know their, their herd and, and make yeah. some overall decisions of quality. Yeah, I mean, th these, are, these are steps that we recommend every year. And so we just thought maybe we'd just remind people of that because this year more people might be considering retaining more heifers than they usually do. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dave Lawman, Extension Livestock Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Talking now about animal health. Dr. Rosalind Biggs looks at the latest information from the CDC about COVID-19 transmission from pets. Well, so we've got new changes to CDC guidelines, just minor changes really. Uh, as far as, you know, how can we interact with our pets uh, when we're outdoors? In research uh, studies, it's been identified that um, cats, ferrets, and a certain type of hamster, a golden Siberian hamster, has been able to um, transmit it from animal to animal, meaning, and when I say it, it's that SARS coronavirus too. And so there's been no documented evidence in animal, other, other species at this time, but it is an ongoing, um, it's, an, it's a changing environment with this virus. And so I think we need to take appropriate precautions. If we're walking our dog, for instance, we still want to maintain that six foot of social distance. And uh, then if we're, particularly if we have cats, especially indoor, outdoor cats, we need to think about uh, bringing them indoors, um, keeping that social distance even with our pets as it relates to um, other animals and, and humans as well. We do want to really try to avoid things like dog parks uh, where we it becomes difficult to maintain that social distance, uh, both amongst animals as well as uh, their owners as well. The general recommendations are to, again, keep your animals with you and your family that you are um, maintaining that, that isolation with and not having an, an interaction. Now, there are exceptions to that. Obviously, if a, an animal needs veterinary care, we, we need to make sure that we get uh, attention to that animal, uh, but veterinary clinics and veterinary hospitals are taking appropriate precautions to still provide care for those animals, but make sure that um, both, both clients as well as uh, doctors and staffs are, are safe as well. You know, we're, we're right here in springtime, uh, right getting into tornado season as well. And so uh, emergency preparedness always becomes important when we, we reach this time of year. And it's, it's equally important, should I become ill, um, are there supplies? Are there instructions for the care of my animals, both pets as well as livestock, uh, if, if I'm unavailable to care for them? Hello. 
Wes Lee with the Mesonet Weather Report. May is the time of year when many producers begin herbicide applications, especially on pasture and range sites. When spraying, wind is one of the most important things to watch. Most herbicide labels now have minimum and maximum wind speeds the product can legally be applied in. This chart shows wind speed at the Weatherford site for the first part of this week. The red line marks the 10 mile per hour mark, a common maximum wind speed listed on several herbicides. You can see that many hours of the days, the winds was too high for controlling drift. To help producers use forecast information to find suitable hours to plan to spray, the Mesonet website has a tool called the Drift Risk Advisor. This tool allows for several different weather variables, including wind, to be bracketed to look for the right conditions. Here I am looking for times where winds are between 2 and 10 miles per hour. You can plug in other variables such as temperature and wind direction as well. The tool will then print a table showing the parameters over the next three and a half days. Here we see perfect wind speeds for spraying on Wednesday afternoon. Now here's Gary discussing rainfall or the recent lack thereof. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well Mother Nature sure cranked up the heat this week. Uh, we had 108 degrees in Frederick which is the highest temperature ever recorded for that early in the season. Um, so definitely some hot weather which didn't help the drought conditions. Let's get straight to that new drought monitor map and see what we have. Well, the same basic picture, but just a little bit worse this week. Uh, we still have that moderate to severe drought up in the far western panhandle. A little bit more abnormally dry conditions across western Oklahoma. That's that yellow color, and that signifies areas going into drought in this case. And we also have another little uh, splotch of uh, D1 moderate drought in Harper County up into far western Woods County. So that's not a good sign for uh, the, the corner of the, uh, the main body of the state up there. Um, that also shows that drought is starting to get a little bit more likely in that part of the state. Um, we see up in the, uh, the Panhandle area, up into Harper County, uh, that's, those are areas with uh, less than 50% of rainfall in general, uh, and in some cases less than 30% as we get out into the far western Panhandle. But really lots of, uh, lots of uh, deficits across all of the northwestern uh, quarter to a third of the state as you look at even over into eastern parts of uh, um, Osage County. So uh, we are starting to see a lot of a dry down uh, across the northwestern parts of the state. Uh, and that is expanding down into uh, central Oklahoma week by week. Now next week we have a little bit uh, of good news, the May 12th through the 16th period. We do see from the outlooks for precipitation from the Climate Prediction Center, increased odds of above normal precipitation across the entire state, even out in the far western panhandle. Not quite as much as the rest of the state, uh, but they'll certainly take those increased odds. Now, anytime you can have above normal precipitation uh, during May, you're going to get some pretty good rainfall. So let's hope that that forecast actually comes true. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, the wheat is starting to turn. Harvest is almost here. Let's start off with production estimates. Well, you look at Oklahoma this week, they came up with 96.5 million bushels. Uh, that's probably a relatively close, in my opinion. Uh, you look at the United States, uh, the uh, number there is about 1.9 billion. Right at uh, last year's, maybe slightly less than that. Uh, you look at the, uh, the Black Sea area, uh, last year uh, they were at 4.2 billion, probably 4.3 billion, slightly higher, but we're a good ways from that harvest yet. And you look at the world, they lowered the, the, the world estimate this last week, 28.1 uh, billion bushels, just about the same as last year. Let's talk now about supply and demand. Ending stocks is a good indicator of supply and demand. In the United States this year, our ending stocks are expected to be about 140 million bushels less than last year. Uh, looking forward to next year, uh, level production and uh, the use of, uh, of the wheat about the same. And so I think we'll have about another 140 million bushel decline in any stocks in the United States. And I think they'll be below average next year. But if you look at the world, uh, production at uh, this year's record 28.1 no change in that uh, we built stocks this last year to a record 10.6 
a billion bushels. We're looking at building stocks in the world next year, uh, probably over 11 billion bushels. So increased world supply, declining U.S. supply. I think that's overall good news. But the big question is, is what's going to happen in the, in the uh, with the exporters? They're, you know, they're because of COVID. They're their uh, building reserves and the word on the street is they're going to build reserves in the black sea area and of course some of your importers like the major one in uh, egypt is also building reserves and so there's a, a lot going on there in this supply and demand situation is there a chance that corn prices could have an impact on wheat prices i think so you know your corn price it's uh right now about a dollar and 20 cents below wheat uh, so you're going to have less wheat fed, and so yes, I think it will have an impact on, uh, on wheat. But we're looking at an uh, increase in corn planted acres. They're talking about over a 15 billion bushel uh, crop next year for corn, and a big increase in corn ending stocks, both in the United States and an increase in stocks in the world. And so that, that tells me that corn prices are going to stay relatively low. Is there a price impact there from COVID? In corn? Well, in corn and wheat, yes, but you've got a positive uh, impact on the wheat, on the food commodities. You've got a, a positive increase in price, uh, rice, wheat, but now in corn, probably a negative increase there. Now, one thing we got to consider with corn is the, uh, Afri the uh, African hog fever in China. You know, corn uh, imports by China are up over 300% over the last couple of months. I think that's a positive impact on our corn prices, but a negative impact from COVID-19 on corn prices. There's just a lot going on in the markets right now. Okay, Kim, thanks for getting us up to speed. And now we turn to our good friend, Larry Sanders, for an update on Oklahoma's participation in the U.S. Census. You don't have to do much more than walk out your front door or get in your automobile and start toward the grocery store or to work and see, literally feel just how important the census is. Money from the state or from the federal government, and that money is parceled out from the tax dollars we pay, but it's redistributed out in parcels because of how many people we have. It goes back to the census that was last taken. We want to be able to count as many people as we have to get as much as we possibly can. We have a personal interest in this for the next 10 years. We have addresses that are not city type addresses, rural route numbers, PO box numbers. Those did not get a reminder or a census survey in the first place. Census Bureau is expecting now to have those people wait. So if you're in Oklahoma and you have a rural route number, address, or a P.O. box number, Census Bureau is saying maybe it's best if you simply wait starting June 1st because of this coronavirus problem. They will send a census worker out. They'll go out into the rural lands of Oklahoma and find you at your address, your physical address. They'll knock on your door if you're there. And if you're not, they will leave an invitation for you to participate that will give you information on how to do that. Or they will leave a survey with you where you can do it at home and mail it in. And between June the 1st and July the 9th, you will have that opportunity to do that. Just like they give you an update on vesicular stomatitis virus, the first case of this year was diagnosed in early April in New Mexico. Uh, this is much earlier than last year because the first case was diagnosed in June last year. Uh, so far, uh, three states uh, have been infected with the virus. That would be New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. All the cases have been in horses up to this point. Um, there are 10 premises that are currently quarantined. Uh, for this disease. 
As you remember in the past, we've talked about the vesicular stomatitis. The reason we get worried about it is we cannot distinguish it from other foreign animal diseases, such as foot and mouth disease or swine vesicular disease. So our only way of distinguishing it is through testing. We can't base it on clinical signs. Uh, typically, the animals that are infected are going to be horses and cattle, but you may also see it in sheep and goats and pigs and some other animals. Typically, when we go out to, and we see this disease, uh, these animals are going to have blisters or vesicles on their mouth or tongue. Usually, the first thing you'll see is a lot of drooling. Uh, we may also see those blisters or vesicles around the lips or nasal passages and some other places like the coronary bands of animals. Uh, this disease uh, spreads fairly easily. It tends to be associated with waterways. Uh, we're not sure why it sporadically occurs in some years and not others. Uh, we do know there seems to be uh, some type of association with flies or midges. Uh, they seem to spread the disease. As far as treatment is concerned, there's no specific treatment. We typically try to control pain, prevent secondary bacterial infections. As far as prevention is go, you need to practice good biosecurity. You need to be sure and have a good insect control program since we know that, that, that the virus is spread through those uh, biting flies and insects. Uh, if you'd like some more information about vesicular stomatitis, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. We want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day this weekend. I'm Lyndall Stout. We'll see you next time at SUNUP.